Why should you have more than just one job? Listen, a biblical, bold business venture. That's what I'm going to talk about today. In our specialized world, folks, we tend to have only one job. Everyone's a specialist. As a result, we tend to adapt a more monolithic mindset focused on making money, job security in order to build and maintain materialistic or recreational driven desired lifestyle, just the way it is, certainly in America. I think other countries are different. Today, I'm going to show you where in God's word he makes clear, very clear that having a single job is rather unwise. Let's get started. Hey everybody, welcome back to Reason for Truth. I'm your host, Stephen Garofalo. This is Reason for Truth, where the truth always comes first, the reasons come last, but where we're always and constantly learning, because we stop learning, we stop teaching, or at least stop teaching well. And today I want to talk to you about work. And those of you, again, who, listen, you're new to the channel, welcome. For those of you who are different parts of your journey with God, you're seeking God, hey, we welcome you here. Those who are seasoned and growing deeply in their faith or teaching others, we really appreciate you tuning in as well. So God's blessings. But welcome to Reason of Truth either way. Listen, working uh, with uh, having a single job is in many cases not as conducive for a purpose-driven life. And I'll explain here. Well, you got to listen to the end for why I'm going to say that. The reason for this is, according to King Solomon Ecclesiastes, is that having just one job or vocation places our job security and success level, I would say our dependence, in the hands of one man or one group of men and women, and not God. Having one job is less risky, which means less faith-driven. Now, I'm going to say there are some good people to work for. I found very few people that I could really commit it all to. Uh, the reason why I do what I do. But, you know, it, it, that's a sad testimony as to the selfishness of mankind, but also the selfishness on our part not to wanting to work hard for our employer, right? Listen, God wants to encourage you and I today not to just have one job, but perhaps possibility to have two or, or more. And we call that career diversification, security, and fulfillment. And that's an important one, the fulfillment. This may mean converting a hobby into a second small job, starting a small business on the side, or even taking a second job that matches your passions and giftedness. Now, I want to be careful here. Whatever you do, if you have children, don't sacrifice your children. I cut a lot of travel out, and it's stymied the ministry growth to some degree. But those, uh, listen, even Billy Graham said one of his greatest regrets is he didn't need to take all his speaking engagements. Not putting myself on the same level as Billy Graham, but I am saying in principle, I think a lot of times we have to see what's most important in life. Make sure we balance it out. The possibilities, by the way, are endless. And God has given us so much and given us gifts and just beautiful life to use all that in. A Kabir Saghal with Harvard University wrote this, when you follow your curiosities, you will bring passion to your new careers, which will leave you more fulfilled. And by doing more than one job, you will end up doing all of them better. We can talk about that later, but but that's pretty exciting. And that's a pretty intriguing. I think a lot of you are going, yeah, that makes sense. Some of you are gonna say, well, that's crazy. You have to do one thing and do it really well. well. Let's talk about that. On June 18th of 2019, the census.gov, Census Bureau, I used to actually do business with Census Bureau when I lived in Washington, DC, but they census.gov published that about 13 million workers, and this is in 2019, June uh, 18th, that uh, that about 13 million U.S. workers have more than one job. I think that number's quite a bit higher. That was at that time equated to about 8% of workers at that time. I, I wouldn't be surprised if it didn't double by now, to be honest with you. Uh, but they had multiple jobs. And this is actually pretty biblical. King Solomon wrote, cast your bread upon the waters and you will find it after many days. Give a portion to seven or even eight, for you know not what disaster may happen on earth. Ecclesiastes 1 verse 2. So what exactly is Solomon saying, or better yet, what is God saying through Solomon at these two short kind of verses here? I believe there are two central points God is making to Solomon and to you and I today. First, what Solomon is saying in verse 1, he says, cast your bread upon the waters. This is actually a metaphorical expression, by the way, taken from the grain trade in a seaport town. We, that kind of is odd for most of us, 80% or more of us live in cities, urban areas, or suburbs. The verse illustrates the central point that successful prospects in a bold business venture are wise to consider but carry some risk, obviously. I think there's risk in life. We fail to take any risks, we, we never get ahead. 
to get a better, more full picture, let's zoom out and look at verses one through six. So it says to cast your bread upon the waters. Well, casting your bread upon the waters is emphasizing, by the way, the element of risk here, uncertainty in business. Solomon is speaking about risk in commercial and agriculture enterprise, which are necessary for success, necessary for anything. Risk, no risk, you know, you got to risk it to get the biscuit. To paraphrase King Solomon, as I just said, you ever seen a TV show? There was a TV show when they used to buy houses on uh, auction houses in Texas. And they said, he says, well, you got to risk it to get the biscuit. In other words, there are no success. There is no success without some risk. Personally, I don't know of anyone who's ever had or been very successful without first having some failure first. Looking at the prior chapter, going back to 10, Solomon dealt specifically with, in that chapter, with royalty privileged people, people of royalty, and you know, we call them the elites today, elite leaders. But here in these verses, verses one to six, Solomon is addressing the average person like you and I. Now, what is Solomon doing? He's provoking you and I and, and, as men and women of God. We must, and he's provoking us for what reason? Well, we must venture forth, take some risk in life. And you know, the older you get, the less risk you want to take. But if we're going to realize gain in business and vocation and ministry and life, we have to take some risk. Solomon says that it's wise to step out in faith, despite the fact that there are always some levels of calculated risk. Listen, we can bury our talents in the ground and be safe, or we can multiply them by using them to God's glory. And I think a little bit sadly today, it wasn't always the case working for the government anymore. It seems to be probably the worst example of this, where you can go to work, you know you can't be really fired, especially if you're in a union, and you're called just to do a job. And sometimes a job, you work a couple hours a day in some jobs, not all. There are people who work very hard for the government. Just go down to the DMV. Those people need combat pay. But you know, I work for the federal government in Washington, D.C., or I sold into the federal government, and I saw a lot of waste there. Listen, we ought to work as hard and as smart as we can, taking calculated, not crazy risks, and giving credit to God for the gifts and blessings that he's given us along the way. And in the end, we ought to help others, you know, that are less fortunate than us. In today's world, too many cases, Christians, they just don't help fellow Christians to, sac you know, in any kind of sacrificial way to achieve their mission. I believe that that out of our selfishness and greed, we miss a lot of blessings. God works around that, but he, he does hold us accountable for what he gives us and what we do in sharing that with others. So to summarize, number one, God calls us to cast our bread upon the waters. So what do we do to earn income, fulfill our life mission? What we do there, it's, it's like a fisherman's net. Our efforts should be wide and diverse, right? A fishing net is very different than a lure. You put one lure, you got one little lure or one fish, one hook, the net is wide and it catches all kinds of stuff. Our efforts should be wide and diverse, taking some risk, working hard and allowing God to provide our success. And in his time, according to his provision, he's going to do great things through us and with us. That's number one. Second, in verse two, Solomon speaks to the value of diversification and our vocation. That's our work in light of uh, mitigating risk. Now, Solomon says to give a portion, that's of our work, to seven or eight, even as high as that. For you know not what disaster may happen on earth. This begs the question is what or who, you know, where to give a, what does this mean? <laughs> what is it, I mean, what is Solomon saying here? Solomon is giving us the why behind the proclamation for diversity of vocation. The answer is because no one knows what calamity may befall one enterprise over another. For example, if you own a farm, right, and it's close to the beach and a hurricane wipe, wipes out your farm, I mean, what do you do, right? How do you make a living? That's kind of a, a, a not a great example because farms are needed to produce food. You have to have a farm, and that's probably one of the best places in some parts of the country. But there are other examples. I have friends of mine, a couple of them that worked in telecom industry. And then what happened? VoIP, VoIP uh, voice over IP. Inter internet protocol. Basically, internet phone versus the old phone came into being, and they didn't keep their skills up to date. And what happened? They ended up finding themselves unemployed and unable to make a living. Now, they ended up adjusting and doing other things. But you see, Solomon's uh, words here were very true in that if they had been doing either sharpening their skills and looking at a different technology or the up and coming technology or something completely different, bottom line is. There's wisdom and diversity, and that would have saved them a lot of aggravation. So, listen, if your job is eliminated, what will you do? 
we need to look ahead uh, and keep our skill sets sharp and up to date and not fall behind the curve, especially in today's world, because I can tell you, things are rough now. Things are about to get really bumpy, I believe, in the United States and throughout world economies. This is what I think. I think this goes very much against modern cultural and certainly corporate and governmental thinking. And a lot of it, for a lot of employees, you know, to live this way, I, I don't think a lot of companies completely are, are completely on board with this. Since the working online revolution came during the, the virus lockdowns, many people now are more, it's more acceptable to work on, and more people don't want to work in an office. They want to work, you know, remotely from their house online. So as a result, understandably, with technology, many employers are angry with this. Some are. On the other hand, it's wise to diversify to some degree because if your job is a limited aid, you're terminated, you know, you see people working, especially as even digital nomads, they're all over the world and they're working for American companies. Why? They're diversified. They're always on cutting edge. But also they know that in many cases, especially in technology, they typically don't do one thing. They'll do one thing and they'll usually do something on the side. Very wise. But this is the point Solomon is making here. Listen, at years past before becoming a specialist culture and a you know, specialist economy, having more than one job or vacation was more normal. As you and I can attest to today, we can be confident that, you know, this is kind of refreshing. And some people say, I just want to do one job. I just want to go do my job and come home and, you know, eat potatoes and, you know, go and watch some TV. Listen, if that's the way you want to live your life, I don't know what to tell you. This perhaps is, this episode is not for you. But as for you and I today as believers, we're called to be much more than that. And you can be confident that God's wisdom never becomes outdated. So neither does Solomon's points here made in this passage. You know, let's talk about risk. Biblically speaking, God makes clear, though, through Solomon, that life and its all its unpredictability carries risks, and there's no way around that. While wisdom cannot remove life's uncertainties, it certainly can help us navigate through and help cope with those risks. And today we looked at two key areas and of uncertainty. First, in the area of finances, Solomon, Qualet, they call him the preacher in Hebrew, encourages us to invest wisely, to cast our bread out on the surface of the water, which is an image of maritime training as, uh, trading, as we've discussed which is a risky business. It certainly was at that time. And I think to some degree it is, you know, now you can look at the fishing reality shows. You know, you don't always catch the fish you think and you're risking your life. There's risk, always risk with that. And think about the time of, certainly when this was written and even the time of Peter, the ultimate fisherman, right? Of Jesus' disciple. They didn't have fish, they didn't have fish radar tell you where the fish are. That's number one. Second, we need to understand that fishing in biblical times as it is today, can be very profitable vocation, but it still carries risk. And as a, a wise investor, we ought not always be adverse to taking some risk, especially when there's genuine possibility of real gain, verse 1. It's part of life, and the only way to get ahead and have a more rewarding life. Some people say, well, I don't want to get ahead. Well, I think I understand. I, I, I'm not saying become rich and greedy or whatever you want to say, that, but I am saying I think God calls all believers to try to move things ahead to some degree. Whatever that looks like, doesn't mean you have to be a Rockefeller or, you know, Jeff Bezos or something. But it does mean you should be moving ahead, not stale and stagnant. So there's recklessness as well that can take place. And taking excess risk it could be bad, especially in your older years. You do really want to take very little, if any, risk. But taking some risk can always be good. Risk to move to a new city, move to a new country, perhaps. Uh, that could be more difficult in your older years, but maybe perhaps that's a good thing. Just cut down on your overhead to live in your older years. And, and in the end, taking some risk to start a business in retirement can be very good for our minds and our financial well-being. Risk at most any time in life is biblical. It can be exciting and it can be rewarding. All right, third and lastly, we do not know which of our ventures will succeed. I think that's one of the central points, verse 6, that Solomon's making or which calamities might come upon us on earth and wipe out one investment or one vocation and one set of gains, verse 2, over another. And so you always have something else to fall back on. We should be engaged in diligent, active labor and avoid looking at passive income. There's really no such thing as passive income. Why? Because there's no such thing as passive income. <laughs> it's like, Steve, what do you mean by that? Well, listen, if you leave any income source idle for very long, it will eventually be overtaken or surpassed by those who work harder than you and less passive than you. Such thinking is laziness. I think it's unwise and it's a formula for failure as Solomon points out. In summary, I want to read the NEB, which 
I think very, very accurately reflects this interpretation of these two verses, Ecclesiastes 11, 1 to 2. And he says this, Send your grain across the seas, and in time you will get a return. Divide your merchandise among seven ventures, eight maybe, since you do not know what disasters may occur on earth. In reality, like the benefits that come from the seafaring trade or fishing folks, active participation and involvement in business gives a promise of some return. Why? Because we're involved in it. There's always the possibility and risk of disasters. So every person should make wise, prudent investments in numerous ventures, right? Even up to seven, yes, maybe even eight. Right then, don't put all your eggs in one basket. That's the bottom line. Ecclesiastes 11, 2. In conclusion, in principle, we have to make sure we're diverse, that we have multiple skill sets and we're able to change on a dime. Perhaps that means having multiple vocations, multiple jobs, but perhaps even a couple different careers or something to fall back. Why? For diversification, security, and fulfillment. And as a byproduct, having more than one job or vocation is fulfilling. It makes us even more productive. How do I know that? Well, I started Reason for Truth. I've written four books. I'm an author. I guess that's a different thing. I've started EquippedAcademy.com for online training. Is it tough? Absolutely. Is it time consuming? You bet. Very much so. Is it rewarding? Yes, it is. Very much. And is my productivity up? Yeah, I had a federal government person I was uh, new from you. He said, how do you get so much done? I said, that's a good point because I just don't do a job. I'm productive. I don't watch sports teams or I don't engage in fruitless recreation. I do like recreation, by the way, just not fruitless an excess recreation. I'm not putting that down, by the way, only fruitless recreation. If that's taking the place of doing God's work, if you're a believer, yeah, you should be putting some time in. I'm not saying you do it all day, every day. Make sure you're giving back to God in that way. In our specialized world, we tend to have only one job. And as a result, having a job in most cases leads to a monolithic mantra to make money, job security, maintain our lifestyle apart sometimes, apart from the purpose-driven life God's given us. And in 2017, remember, Harvard Business article under career planning, by the way, titled, Why Should You Have At Least Two Careers? By Harvard, by Kabir Seghal, S-E-H-G-A-L, on April 25th, 2017. Remember, I want to end with these words. When you follow your curiosities, you will bring passion to your new careers, which will leave you more fulfilled. And by doing more than one job, you will end up doing all of them better. Kabir single. Kabir, man, if you're watching or listening, did a great job in saying that. Ditto, ditto, ditto. And I would say he's echoing exactly what King Solomon said. So listen, before you go now, let's make sure you think about that. Pray about that. Think about what you're doing with your life. A lot to be had out there. Take the bull by the horns. Ed, before you leave, make sure you do a couple things. You know, I always tell you, subscribe, bam, hit the subscribe button. Then click that little alert bell so you don't miss any of the subscribe you know, episodes come out a couple times a week. And if you want to interact a little bit more, you go to stephengarafalo.com, free of charge, a few different articles there a week, and you can interact with me. God's blessings to you. I'm your host, Stephen Garofalo, and this is your reason for truth for today.